Let's get back to that memory hierarchy. Remember, we've got this pyramid with the different levels, and we've done this a bunch of times, probably gonna see it again. Top level, the registers. The small amount, very small, and when I say very small, I mean we're talking about 16 maybe. 16 of these memory locations that are inside the process are very high performance, directly connected to things like the arithmetic logic unit where logic and mathematics are performed. Now, outside of the CPU core, but still internal to the processor is something we have called a cache, cache memory. Then we have main memory. And then we have long-term storage. All right, now we've talked a little bit about main memory, talked about addressing, talked about patterns of ones and zeros that refer to a single memory location. And that single memory location could be a real memory location, could be some sort of a device that we're trying to configure, control, or read, all right? But what we're gonna do is we're gonna move up from main memory, we're gonna talk about the cache. But before we talk about the cache, we need to talk a little bit about the effective memory access time or the effective access time for any, from the perspective of the processor. And so what we've got is the processor needs something could be an instruction to execute, could be data, could be anything that the processor typically, that, that is stored in main memory, that the processor needs to bring into its registers, all right? Now, before we can talk about that, we have to understand the process. And, and if you looked at my earlier memory hierarchy um, discussion, you heard me talking about uh, milk, right? I need milk for my cereal. Where am I going to find it? Well, though I check the closest place first, and if it's not in the closest place, then I go to the next closest place, and if it's not in the next closest place, I go to the next closest place. And I keep going until I get to the point, like long-term storage, like the supermarket, where you know there is always going to be milk. All right? Now, we have something called, we, we've got a couple of terms here. First of all, we're going to have a term called a miss which means that uh, the information, the, the byte, the, the instruction, the data, so whatever, the data, the memory element, the element was not found at that, that particular memory level. And when I say that particular memory level, we're going to say that the processor is looking for an instruction to execute. It goes in the first place it checks is the cache. Now, if it's not there, it says, okay, I need to go to main memory. That would be a cache miss, all right? Now, if it went to the cache and it found what it was looking for, that's called a hit. So element found at memory level. Now, there are, there's, there are a couple of, of, of other types, of, there's a couple of measurements we're going to be using. And one of those in particular, and, and there's a corresponding one for miss, but we're gonna talk about the hit rate. And that's the percentage of time that the element was found at a particular level, all right? Now, I'll try and get it out of the way of some of my text here. So, for example, a 90% hit rate, hit rate would say, say that, we, uh, that, that out of every 10 times we went to the cache, nine times we found what we were looking at, one time we had a miss, all right? And so, basically, the hit rate, the percentage of time, right? So the hit rate, one minus the hit rate is equal to the miss rate. All right. Now, let's also talk about access times. And, and so let's just say, I don't know, I'm going to make up a couple of numbers. How about if, if we have a hit and find what we're looking for in the cache, let's say that it takes three nanoseconds, three times 10 to the negative ninth seconds in order to bring whatever I found into the, back into the processor. So that's pretty quick, right? Now, if there's a miss, the time it takes to go out to main memory to find that same element 
gonna be a little slower. And in fact, if it wasn't slower, we wouldn't need the cache. For example, if we had a main memory that had an access time of three nanoseconds, there's no reason to have the cache. The main memory is larger, it's cheaper. Remember, as we are going down through the processor, through the memory hierarchy, away from the processor, things get cheaper per bit to store, capacity gets larger, but it takes a little longer. So let's say that main memory takes 30 nanoseconds in order to get what we're looking for. Now, we are looking at computing something called the effective access time. And it'd be helpful if I spelt access correctly, wouldn't it? Access time. All right, now, the, the effective access time is basically from the point of view of the processor, what's the average time to get stuff? You know, sometimes I'm going to be getting it out of the cache, sometimes I'm going to be getting it out of main memory, you know? So, what on average, what is the effective time? Now, sorry, we're going to do a little math, but it's just multiplication and addition, so it's not a huge deal. And what we're going to look at is that the effective access time That is equal to basically the, the, the hit rate, right? So the, the hit rate for finding something in the cache times the time for the cache plus, and that, remember that's a percentage, so it's less than one, and then one minus the hit rate times the time it takes to grab something from main memory, all right? So, I don't know, let's just say 80%. Let's just say we have a hit rate is equal to 80%. That means that the effective time is equal to 0.8 times three nanoseconds plus one minus 0.8 or 0.2 times 30 nanoseconds. All right, so how much time, what, what's the effective time there? Now, what we've got is eight times three, that's two, excuse me, 0.8 times three is 2.4 nanoseconds. And then 0.2 times 30 nanoseconds, that's six nanoseconds, all right? Add those two together, we've got an effective time of 8.4 nanoseconds quicker than going all the way out to main memory, right? But it's still not as good as it could be if we were able to access more, if we were able to have a lower, uh, a lower miss hit rate, a higher hit rate coming out of the cache. So if we change some things around here a little bit, see if we can improve this. Well, let's make some room and bring our hit rate, let's go ahead and bring it up to 90%. And I'll show you in a minute how we can affect the hit rate. So let's do a hit rate, change color here, hit rate of 90%, do a little bit better. And what we've got is 0.9 times three nanoseconds. So the access time to the cache is still the same. Plus, and now we've got 0.1 times 30 nanoseconds, all right? Now, Compute that out, so 0.9 .9 times three is 2.7 nanoseconds, plus 0.1 times 30 is three nanoseconds, and what we've done is we've got this down to 5.7 nanoseconds. Now, the important thing to look at here is that this actually doesn't take any change in the hardware. It just takes a change in, in how we use the hardware, how we format our code, the way we, the way we get our code to, you know, how, how we organize our code so that the cache can utilize it a little bit more efficiently. All right, so just simply bringing that up uh, by just a little bit, by 10%, we can actually significantly improve this. Now, what's the lower limit? What's, what's, what's the absolute fastest? Well, the absolute fastest would be 100% hit rate. 100% hit rate's impossible to do because when we first power up our machine, when we first start executing code, all the code is in main memory. None of it is in the cache, and so we have to load the cache. So there is going to be a little bit of a, uh, of a miss rate. There has to be at the very beginning. But when we, before we start talking about um, how to improve the hit rate,
let's take a look at how the natural organization of our code supports the use of a cache. Okay, now if you're watching this, you're probably familiar with code, just a little bit. Maybe you don't know a lot about code, but you've probably seen something like a for loop, right? So for, we have some sort of an integer i equals zero, i less than 100, i plus plus. That's one format of the for loop. You may have tried, you know, depending on the programming language, you've had all sorts of other loops where there's a counter involved. But what we've got is just simply a counter i that's going to count as we, it's going to increment as we go through this loop going from 0 up to 99. Once it gets to 100, it's going to fall out the bottom of the loop. And so everything between these curly braces is being executed. So we've got some lines of code in there. Now, one of the things that we know from our experience is that, well, there are, there's, there's this thing called a locality of reference. And the locality of reference, maybe make this a little bit more, <laughs> a little more grammatically correct. Well, maybe not grammar, but spelling and, and capitalization. Locality of reference says, that it says two things. First of all, it says that once executed, or I probably should have put a better word there, probably accessed would be a better word because we're also talking about data here, not just instructions. But once executed or accessed, a data element or a memory element, an element from a memory, an element from memory, will be used again soon. More than likely, I, I'm missing some words there, but hey, give me a break. I don't have a whole lot of room here on this screen. So let me try that again. Once used, once accessed, an element, data or instruction, more than likely is going to be needed again. But there's a second part of the locality of reference. It also says that neighbors, or nearby, nearby instructions or nearby data will also be used soon. All right. Um, which my which my which my which my definitions were working a little bit better today, but they're not. Now there are really three types. There's actually two types of of uh, the locality of reference, and sometimes it's called the principle of locality you'll hear me use those two interchangeably. So there's really two things here that we're trying to define here. Now this one, once executed, a data element will probably be used again. This is called temporal locality. In other words, over time, we're gonna probably need it again, right? And we actually see this with our for loop down here. So if I go ahead and execute that instruction right there, I've got to do this loop a hundred times. So more than likely, I'm going to come back through this loop and probably going to execute that instruction again. So once it's been executed once, we're probably going to do it again. Now this guy right here, this is spatial locality. In other words, well, let's try this again. Spatial locality, and spatial locality says that if I take, if I go to memory to get something, you know, more than likely, I'm going to get its buddies too. And, and that works by looking at this, and so this thing here, or this, this, you know, this uh, loop here, I execute this first instruction, I'm probably going to execute the second one, I'm probably going to execute the third one. And so by grabbing something, I'm probably going to be grabbing some of its neighbors too. So what that means in terms of memory is if I have, to, if I have a miss on the cache, then I go out to main memory and I grab not only the element that I've been accessing so that it's in the cache so that the next time I use it, it'll be in the cache and I won't have a miss. But while I'm at it, why don't I bring some of its buddies with it? In other words, if I look at this guy, maybe all of these guys, are to, they, they should be all together in memory. If I grab this guy, go ahead and grab two and three also. 
That way, if I've got three instructions, then my if the first time through the loop, I'm only going to have one miss. I'm going to miss instruction one. But instruction two and three, since they were brought in at the same time one was, all three of them will be in the cache, I'm only going to have one miss, and then I'm going to have a hit for two and a hit for three. And that way, I've only got a 33% miss. But remember, I've got temporal locality too. And in this loop, I'm going to execute this loop a hundred times. And so this loop gets executed a hundred times. I have one miss out of 300 instructions. One miss out of 300 instructions. So that's a, that's a, a hit rate of 0.33%, right? It's really small. So we can actually get that hit rate, get that hit rate pretty high and the miss rate, excuse me, did I say hit rate? I meant to say miss rate. I missed 0.333%, which means I have a hit rate of 99.667. That's a lot better, right? Now, the fact that I usually do execute instructions one after the other, this is called sequential locality. Now, you can see that sequential locality and spatial locality really closely related. Um, and, and so really, there, when we're talking about locality, really there's these two primary ones, but, but spatial locality has a special subcategory of sequential locality. Now, how does that work with data? Well, when you're declaring variables, like I'm going to de declare int A, B, C, you know, these three variables, I've declared them together, which more than likely means that they're being used together in the same portion of code. So variables have exactly the same sort of concepts of, of locality that code does. All right. So we now have an, an idea of how we can get our processors to execute out of the cache quicker, to execute or to have a higher hit rate, right? And that higher hit rate is achieved by grouping the instructions together, making loops so that when we have a miss, we'll just bring in a group of things together and then we'll have a whole bunch of hits. So how do we automate something like this? How do we make it so that I don't need to do anything in my code, it's done automatically in the hardware? Well, one of the primary things that we do in order to make sure that it's done properly in the hardware is to organize or to divide, excuse me, to divide our memory up into something called blocks. Let's talk about blocks right now. So how do we make hardware that takes advantage of this principle of locality or this locality of reference? How do we make it so that the hardware itself automates the process of taking, you know, if we request one element from memory, we bring in a group of elements. Well, it turns out we use exactly the same principles we use that we did whenever we used, when we created those chip selects. Remember, we've got this idea of a full address, right? So the whole address. And we break it into two pieces. Now, with the chip select, what we did was we had a large memory that we had to map to a certain portion of the memory address, uh, to the memory address space or the address space of the processor. And we drew this line where all the bits to the left defined a, defined a specific pattern of ones and zeros that identified a memory device. And then the bits that were to the right of that line, those defined the memory, ad, the, the memory device itself. And and in fact, the number of bits defined how big the memory device was. Well, what we're going to do now is we're going to make that line, but we're going to move it way over to the right side. Now, these bits right here, we're going to call the word ID bits. Now, <clears throat> the term word gets used in a couple of different ways whenever it comes to uh, computing. Word, for a lot of us, meant 16 bits, two bytes, all right? But in this case, what we're saying whenever we say a word, we're talking about an element of memory, 
whether it's, a, whether it's data or an instruction. It is a word. It is what we're reading from memory, from that memory location. Now, the rest of these bits are referred to as a block ID, or as block ID bits. Now, the block ID bits, <coughs> those reference which one of the groups of words we're going to be referring to. Let me try this again, and I'm going to do this by, 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 well, you know, remember the memory map. It was this long rectangle. Well, I'm going to zoom way in. So we're going to look at just a tiny, tiny spot in that memory. So I'm going to just simply draw a little bit of memory here. And it'll be divided into a bunch of memory locations. And I don't know, we'll just, I don't know how many of these things we'll make. So we'll pick an address. And, and in the interest of board space, it's going to be a small address. Assume that this processor just has, oh, I don't know, how about um, 1K of memory, you know, total. So we're only going to have a 10-bit address. And I don't know, let's do, how about... Um, so is that 10 bits? Looks like 10 bits to me. Okay, so that's the address right there. And then we've got 1010. And tell you what, why don't you all occupy yourselves while I finish drawing this list? All right, so let's go back to this idea of a block ID and a word ID. Now, what happens is the processor says, I don't know, I need the value from this memory location. It reads that, it requests that. Now, remember, first place we check, what's nearest to us? The cache. Now, this particular element hasn't been used before, and neither has any of its buddies, so none of that is in the cache. So we have a cache miss. So we have to go all the way out to main memory. Going out to main memory, we grab this, but remember, the locality of reference says it's a good idea not only to bring that element into the cache, but to bring its buddies into the cache too. So, what we do is we specify a certain number of word ID bits. Two bits means that what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the whole block in that has the same block ID bits, but every single possible pattern of ones and zeros for those two bits that are being used as the word ID. So if we are just using two bits, that means, and sorry, this is probably, I probably could have used a better color in order to separate my vertical lines from my numbers. But what you do is you bring in everything that has the same block ID. And all of the word ID bits tell you how far or what the offset into the block is in order to find the element. So, for example, the value that we were looking for had a block ID of 10101101. So all of those, all four of those are together. And the element that the processor was looking for had an offset of one into that block. This whole block, all four of those values are going to be brought into the, into the cache. And then the one element that the processor was asking for, that's going to be given to the processor. But that way, if, for example, if this was an instruction that was being executed, if we go to execute this instruction, now this guy's already in the cache because the whole block was brought into the cache at the same time. All right. Now, the word ID bits, you know, if we just have one word ID bit, that's only going to give us two elements in a single block, right? If we have two word ID bits, that's going to bring four in. If we have three word ID bits, well, let's go ahead and do a little bit different. Let's let's go ahead and draw this line here for three word ID bits. And what you can see is that our block size now becomes eight. So for three word ID, so this was for two bit word ID bit. And then this would be for three bit, right? So these guys right there, so these three, these eight elements, those would be brought in if I had a three bit ID. So, so 
Yes, I've kind of made things a little bit messy up here. These four elements belong to the same block if we have a two-bit word ID. These eight elements, notice that from, if, you know, if these three bits are my word ID, these eight elements all have the same block ID. So if I wanted to grab this guy, I would actually bring all eight of those into the processor. Now, we've got kind of a trade-off. What happens is, is that the more word ID bits we get, the more we'll be bringing into the cache, but think about it this way, the fewer blocks we'll be able to have. The blocks will be larger, but we'll be able to have fewer blocks in the cache. And you get to a point where the block size is so big, for example, if I have four bits as my word ID, then this whole, all of these addresses, all 16 of those addresses are considered one block. And so needing this element will bring all 16 in. And all 16 of those, you get to a point where the buddies are starting to get kind of far away and there might be less and less of a chance that the buddy that you brought in, that address that you brought in, will actually be used. And it comes at the cost of being able to store fewer blocks in the cache. And so maybe my for loop is contained in just these eight, but these this this code right here is not going to be executed. So it wasn't necessarily uh, it wasn't necessarily helpful to bring in all sixteen elements. That's something that as a as the hardware designer you'll be able you'll need to pay attention to. But as the software designer, you really don't need to worry much about because usually the cache is already set up. But you can set up your programs so that if you know the block size and so forth, you can make sure that things, that the cache is used efficiently. All right. Now, that brings us to basically the last topic for this video, and that's how these guys are stored inside of the cache. Let me go ahead and make some room. All right, now, how is the cache organized? Well, from the point of view of the cache, you've got basically a large block of memory that is organized into lines. So the cache is made up of a bunch of lines. So we've got these lines here. Now, each line is made up of two elements, two components. The first component is the tag. Now, the tag, remember, we talked on a previous lesson about the type of addressing that a cache uses. And the type of addressing that a cache uses is called associative addressing. And associative addressing says that with all the stored data, we associate with it some sort of an element, a pattern of ones and zeros that identifies where it came from. And so the tag, it identifies where, and I'm going to say block here, I'm going to get ahead of myself, but basically it identifies where the block in the line came from. All right, so the rest of the line, this is the block or the data, right? And so, for example, if I had a single bit word, a single bit for the word ID, then that would mean that I'd have the first element here, the element with an offset of zero, and the element with an offset of one here. In my example, my first part of my example, I said, well, okay, we'll have a four-bit, excuse me, a two-bit word ID, which gives us four possible four memory locations. So we'd have an offset of 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. If I had a three-bit word ID, then that means that I would have stored for each line, I would have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Four-bit word ID, I'd have 16. So basically what you've got in a line is you've got the tag, which identifies where it came from, and then all the elements that were loaded from memory, all right? What tags could we use? Well, it turns out that there are a lot of different tags that we can use. Well, not a lot. There are really just three types of configurations we can use. But typically, 
the block ID bits drive the tag. So usually the tag identifies the block that it came from. So if I read something from memory, then I can use the tag in order to figure out where that block came from. We're going to use do a couple of examples to show exactly how to associate the block ID with the tag so that whenever you consider how a cache works and you want to say, okay, this element came from this location in memory because I know the tag can be used to derive the block ID. That's going to be coming up in the next few lessons. For now, just remember that each line contains a block of elements and an identifier called a tag, which can be used to identify where that element came from in memory.